Hey everybody, welcome back. I hope that you're doing well. I'm a little under the weather, I'm gonna tell you right away, but I'm gonna do my best to be engaged and be with you and be fully present and deliver a lecture and create a discussion for us. As you know, we are discussing political regimes and we've already had a conversation about authoritarian rule and different forms of authoritarian regime. This week, we are focusing on democracy and democratization. And this discussion gets us talking about some of the most important issues of all in comparative politics. Now, before we get started, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I sent you a study guide for the midterm exam. I sent that this morning. And I told you in the email that I'd be discussing the guidelines for the midterm exam today in class a little bit before we get started. And I will be doing that here momentarily, but I do encourage you to use that study guide, fill it out, review the vocabulary and the topics for review and the readings that I list on that study guide. That study guide should help you to prepare in a way that is thorough and, and complete, and it should get you off on a good foot for, for the exam. Now, the exam itself will take place on Tuesday, October 6th, which is a week from today. And it will take place during regularly scheduled class time. And the way this will work is I will post the exam under assignments on CAT courses at the start of class time, or maybe even a little bit before class time, if I'm feeling generous. And you will have the duration of class time to complete it. So this will essentially work in the same way that it might in person, but obviously we're not in person. You'll have the duration of class to complete the exam and you will obtain that exam and then submit it in the same place. And that will be under assignments. Now, obviously the exam is open book and I encourage you to use all of your materials. That includes readings, class notes, slides, recordings, the videos that we've watched, um, etc. all of the above. And I will be available during this time to take any questions that you might have. There will be a Zoom link available. Now you don't need to check in with me, uh, but if you want to, you're encouraged to do so. And I want you to have all of the amenities that you would ordinarily have. Now, granted, this is a different circumstance. You'll be taking this alone at home, um, but I want you to use the materials available to you and, and to use me as a resource as well. Now, in terms of the actual content of the exam, it will consist of somewhere between five and seven definitions of concepts and supporting examples where appropriate. With these, you only need two to three sentences to provide a complete definition. And what I want to tell you is that those concepts that you may find on the exam will all be concepts that we defined in class. And so we worked with a particular understanding of those concepts and you shouldn't need any more than two or three sentences at the very most to define them in a way that is complete and thorough and meaningful for us in the class. Now, what that means though, is that they should be relatively specific in that the definition should not be one that you make up on your own. It should cohere very closely to what we understand the concept is meaning in, in the context of our class. Now the essay component will be a little bit longer, just in the sense that it will be a longer written response, and it should be a standard five to seven paragraph essay. Now you can write a five paragraph essay that includes the introduction and the conclusion. The introduction should briefly outline the argument and the supporting points, and the conclusion should bring together the main points and highlight uh, the key takeaway from the essay. Now the essay should demonstrate knowledge from the readings and should cite them. I'm interested in how you can use the readings creatively to engage the key themes in the class. I understand and know that much of the content does come from class notes and that the foundation for our understanding will often come from the lecture, but I'm interested in you demonstrating knowledge and showing me and showing your TAs that you have engaged those readings and completed them and taken something away from them that is substantial and that can figure into a, a meaningful essay. Now, this exam is designed to be 
taken in an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, I don't intend to overburden you and I'm well aware of the time constraint. Really, I'm more interested in giving you something that can be relatively easily completed within the allotted time um, for the most part than giving you something that's going to stretch you thin and, and, and cause you to have great difficulty addressing each part of the exam fully and, and, and completely. And so I want you to go into this confidently and feeling prepared and capable. And I want you to take something from this that will prepare you for the rest of the class. This is our first written assignment in the course. And what that means then is it will set the, the tone for much of the rest of the class. And what you'll see and what you'll notice on the study guide is that the concepts and the topics for review help to kind of create that foundation by focusing on the key themes. And so many of you maybe have not yet seen that study guide, but I do encourage you to download that as soon as possible and begin completing that and devote some time to preparing for the exam. Even though it's open book and even though you have access to all of the materials, you'll need to be prepared to address certain issues or themes that come up in the exam and that requires preparation. I'm confident that you'll prepare effectively and that you'll use those materials available to you and that you'll use me as a resource and you'll use your TAs as well. And so we've got a week before the exam and that should be sufficient time for you to address those questions that you have and to raise issues that might come up uh, and, that, and that would be important for us to address as a class as well as individually. Now, before we continue, I'm, I'm aware that there may be some questions or some comments about the exam, the guidelines, the format. Um, I'm happy to take those right now or to address some of the concerns that you may have. I'm well aware that this is a new circumstance for many of us in terms of how we'll be taking the exam and how it might affect our preparation. And I intend to be as supportive as possible uh, and to help you and to guide you and so that ultimately the, the logistics are, are less of a concern and so we can focus on the content. But before we continue, um, I do want to open it up and give you a chance to make any comments or ask any questions. Are there any comments or questions that you have about the exam? Oh, I just had, a, I don't know if it was discussed about for the five or seven definition, for example, sub concepts. Um, so do we have to like also give like an illustration of, of in our readings or in, in our, um, or in our discussions, anything regarding to that example or definition? I don't know if it was talk, talked about. Good question, Efren. So what you'll notice is that some of those concepts don't lend themselves to examples. Um, and in those cases, it's less important. But for instance, sultanism, you know, it's a type of authoritarian regime. We had a number of different examples of sultanism that came up in the class notes. With that concept, it would be, more, it would be sufficient for you to define the concept and then to just provide an example. And you don't need to even go into that much detail or really any detail. You might say, for instance, Turkmenistan is an example of a sultanistic regime or Turkmenistan under Nyazov. That would be a sufficient example, assuming that your definition covers the key features of that type of authoritarian regime and does so concisely in, in two to three sentences. And so I know that sometimes with these concepts and definitions, it can be easy to kind of get carried away. And I remember, for, for instance, when I was an undergrad, it wasn't that long ago, by the way, everyone, I would write probably too much. I would write, you know, a half a page or maybe three quarters of a page for each concept. That's a bit too much. You don't need that much. We can more concisely define these terms and the supporting examples that we give. The meaningful aspect of an example is that it sort of is self-evident, right? It speaks for itself. So it should fit closely with the definition that you provide. You shouldn't need to actually clarify or say much about the example itself, right? It should by itself kind of illustrate or embody, or it should remind me of those characteristics that you outline in the definition. And so the example is just kind of a way to check or kind of show 
your understanding. Uh, and, and that doesn't require you to go into that much, much detail and really any, as far as the example is concerned. Kevin, I recognize that many of us have maybe not completed an essay online for a test, but I will remind you that we've conducted this class in a way that is hopefully as close to an in-person experience as possible with the delivery of the lecture, the discussion, assigned readings, content, concepts, themes, topics. And I think that the class and the content do lend themselves to a written response. And I'm interested in how you engage these themes creatively. Uh, multiple choice, as far as I'm concerned, is not that useful because it's not engaging your capacity to make connections between issues and themes. And so while you may be concerned and while I understand that, I would encourage you to be open to the possibility that we can do this effectively. And I also want you to remember as well that your TAs and I are aware of the different circumstances that we're under uh, and that that will, that will affect the way we, we evaluate these. And so we're here to support you and we're here to be understanding and I want us to remain focused on our objectives in the course, which do relate to analytical and critical thinking and the kinds of skills that we really can only develop through written responses, in my personal opinion. And that's my philosophy as an, as an instructor. Um, and though these are difficult circumstances, I believe that we would be giving away too much if we uh, you know, wrote off those written responses. Dorian says, is there any specific topic to the exam or is it on the material that we have gone over? Dorian, I would encourage you to review the, the study guide that I sent out this morning and it's posted on CAT courses. That will outline all of the potential vocabulary and, and topics for review that will be either very, very similar or even the same as what you'll see uh, on the actual exam. Caesar says, will all exams have the same format as this one, definitions then essay? Yes, so the syllabus clarifies that the exams have this format, concepts for definition and then one longer essay question. Kevin says, I'm ready, of course, and I didn't think it would be multiple choice. Good question, Caesar. Right on, Kevin. Uh, I don't mean to imply that you, that you might have thought that. Sometimes students ask if it will be multiple choice, um, but what I've discovered over the years is that, you know, the choices that we have between the types of exams to give can have a really important consequences for what you take away from the course. And ultimately in the end, even if you don't remember some of these definitions or some of these specific themes, I want you to build and, and sort of strengthen your capacity to engage in, in theoretical debates, you know, through your own kind of critical analysis or your own original research, which you'll conduct in the, in the papers for the course. Are there any other comments or questions about the exam? I want to address as many of them as we can and so that we have plenty of time for preparation. Some students are worried about the time uh, writing an essay. I'm aware that there are some concerns about timing and some students are more deliberate in their thought process and take a little bit more time. If you are one of those students, I would encourage you to speak to me individually. I'm a flexible individual and I understand that each student has unique circumstances and I want to support you above all. And so please leave open the lines of communication. While I do believe that this approach is the most effective as far as the exam is concerned, I'm also aware that not every student is the same and I wanna support all of you. Uh, and so please, speak to me if you're one of those students who has that concern. But otherwise, uh, I do think that the exam will be designed in such a way as, as, to, be, as to be doable um, for students. Again, my intention is to give you something that will develop key critical capacities without overburdening you. This is our first written assignment. I'm aware of the time constraint, the circumstances, but I think that ultimately this is something that we can do. And I believe in all of you and I, I want to motivate you and inspire you to do your best and to feel supported in this environment uh, and to feel as though we can learn from this in more ways than one. But do speak with me if you're one of those students. 
other comments or questions about the exam before we continue? As I sit here, I'm watching my cats do parkour off the furniture in the living room. And so it's keeping things interesting, even though I don't feel that great. Does anyone else enjoy being at home for that reason? You need more time with your loved ones, more time with your pets. <laughs> but when it comes to the exam, you might want to try to find a quiet place or a space where you can, you can focus for an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, right on Caesar. I'm really glad to hear that. It's one of the perks, one of the silver linings, more time with newborns, more time with loved ones. Of course, the circumstances are challenging and sometimes that weighs in as well. Ian says, my cat just meows 24 seven and grips my leg with her, with her claws. <laughs> Rady says, I love waking up three minutes before class. Right on. <laughs> Give me just a moment here. So this is Bernie. He's a little rambunctious right now. He's biting my hand. I think he wants to me to let him go. But I love spending my time with him when I can which is all the time. <laughs> and we have another cat here as well, an older one named Cadence. And so we have a lot of fun with them. Okay, everybody. So I feel like we've touched the most important bases regarding the exam. And you can probably tell I'm a little bit winded today because I'm just not feeling well at all. Um, but I'm going to hold it together and we're going to embark on a really interesting discussion about possibly the most important topic of all in comparative politics, which is democracy and democratization. After the state and after the nation, we find ourselves often discussing different forms of government. And one of those forms, of course, is authoritarianism. And you know what characterizes authoritarian regimes and the different types of authoritarian regimes. But democratic governments are another form of, of government. And it's the form that we may be more familiar with here in the United States. But of course, if we have familiarity with Latin America, which I know as many of us, including myself, for the work that I've done there, uh, we're also familiar with authoritarian rule and how transitions from authoritarian rule to democratic rule take place and, and what they look like and the kinds of actors they involve. Our discussion today is going to begin relatively broadly and we're going to put democracy in historical perspective first and foremost so that we can kind of take an angle that helps us to think about the themes and the development of our understanding of democracy. Now, as you know, we live in a world that largely agrees on the importance and desirability of, of democratic regimes. But it hasn't always been this way. Um, the fact is, until about the mid 1800s, democracy was seen as obsolete. It was seen as untenable and dangerous and unstable. And it was viewed with suspicion, primarily by elites and by intellectuals and thinkers. But in general, the view of democracy was that it did not support the kind of politics that was desirable. Now, we know that today a lot has changed and our opinion and our view of democracy has really been transformed. But the way we got there is an interesting story in and of itself. And it helps to set the stage for the rest of the discussion today, which will focus on measures of democracy and what we mean by democracy and how we know that we've seen a democracy when we see one, and questions about what we want from a democracy and, and ultimately what we can hope for from a de democratic regime. 
concern with the merits of different forms of government goes back as far as Aristotle and Plato, ancient times. Demos meant common people, people like you and I. And by that, I mean ordinary people. I'm no elite. I'm the son of a farmer's daughter in a rural place in Nebraska. And we are common people, unless you're an office holder or some you know, magnate, it's very likely that you fall under that umbrella of an ordinary person. And it's, it's people like us who were associated or, or affiliated with this notion of demos. And we didn't have economic independence or much education. We had limited knowledge of politics, at least back in ancient times. We know that today much has changed and we're all educated and we all have a great deal of knowledge. But as far as ordinary people were concerned, this was their status and their station in life. And it was these ordinary people without independence or education or knowledge who were often associated with democracy. And these people, these ordinary people like you and I, were expected to pursue their own interests at the community's expense. Now it's interesting that that would be the case because today we're often skeptical of elites who take charge and are often the elected leaders in democracies because we believe that they pursue their interest at the community's expense. This is part of the story of the evolution of this concept in the historical foundation of, of our understanding of democracy, the way that it has been transformed over time. But the starting point is one that views ordinary people as synonymous with democracy and who views those people with skepticism and views them in a way as, as perhaps incapable of, of governing themselves. Plato, for example, did not see government or did not see democracy as government by the people, but as government by the uneducated poor against the educated rich. Notice that it was the rich for whom education was reserved and the poor were often, you know, unprivy to, to education. And this meant that those uneducated poor were just simply not equipped to govern either themselves and certainly not others. Now, Aristotle disagreed. Aristotle said that sometimes the will of the many could be equal or wiser than the will of the few. But Aristotle himself was ultimately also skeptical of the capacity of ordinary people like you and I to govern ourselves and by extension, skeptical of democracy. Now this skepticism was important because it legitimated forms of government that we would think of as more authoritarian, monarchy, tyranny, or at least the concentration of power in the hands of a few. Those forms of government that we discussed last week as synonymous with authoritarian rule. Now the types of authoritarian rule were a little bit different and the way that they were conceived was different. But this distinction between authoritarianism and democracy was viewed very differently. Democracy itself was viewed with skepticism. Authoritarianism was viewed more favorably. Now, Aristotle, of course, while carrying this view and embodying this view in some way, had a more nuanced take. And while Aristotle did see democracy as class rule by the worst class, and really saw it as mob rule and an extreme form of, of government, the most dangerous and the most corrupt form of government, he also acknowledged that other forms of government had their limitations too, and that really any form of government could be corrupted in a way that would pervert or undermine you know, the functioning of government for the interest of the community. And so Aristotle had this typology that distinguished between one, few, and many rulers. And each of these different numbers of rulers or these forms of government based upon the number of rulers could be distinguished in terms of the good form and the corrupt form. And so when it came to monarchy or authoritarianism, the presence of one ruler, the good form was monarchy. It was the idea that there was a benevolent monarch or king or queen who could rule in the interests of the community and rule in a way that was favorable to all. Now, of course, the corrupt form of monarchy was tyranny, or the corrupt form of authoritarian rule was tyranny. And this was for the good of the rulers, as opposed to for the good of the community. 
Aristotle also distinguished between few and many. Those regimes that had few rulers took the good form of aristocracy or rule by a, a selected elite who were viewed as capable of ruling in the interest of the many. But the corrupt form was ruled by an oligarchy or a set of elites who ruled in the name of themselves in, in, the, in their own interests and often undercutting the interests of the community. And then of course there were forms of government characterized by many rulers. And this was democracy, or at least this was what was associated with what was seen as the corrupt form of democracy. And this meant in its good form, polity or rule by many for the good of the community. In its corrupt form, it was viewed as democracy. Democracy was the most extreme form of government in this regard because it was ruled by the many for the good of the rulers. But interestingly, doesn't rule by the many mean rule by all? And if all are the rulers, is that not rule in the interest of the community? We'll put aside these quibbles and we'll highlight that our understanding of democracy is very different today. We no longer distinguish between one, few, and many. But before we get there, let's take a look at intellectual history and think about, focus on the different notions associated with democracy at the time and the way that it was viewed by thinkers that you may be familiar with or that you may recognize. The truth is that democracy was not even associated with elections. In the 18th century, it was really viewed as government in which offices are distributed by lot. And so there wasn't a role for elected elections or contestation of the kind that we discussed last week. Instead, it was viewed really as distribution and democracy was viewed as distributing offices based upon some other measure. And so Montague said, suffrage by lot is natural to democracy as that by choices to aristocracy. And thinkers like Bowdoin and Hobbes and Locke and Vico, Montague, Kant and Hegel all consistently preferred monarchy to democracy. Hegel, for example, classic conservative traditional thinker viewed monarchy as preferable to democracy because of the benevolence of the monarch, the capacity of these elites to rule in the interest of the many as a benevolent monarch. Now, we may question this today because our understanding has changed very substantially. Back then, democracy was seen as obsolete. It wasn't viewed as advantageous to the many it wasn't viewed as advantageous to the community. It meant direct legislation by the people, not their representatives. There wasn't a notion of representative democracy. Democracy in ancient Greece meant rule by the many and by the populace, not by representatives or leaders elected by those in the populace to represent them in office. Instead, it was about direct democracy or popular democracy, if you will. And the idea was that this could work in Athens, but not in the modern world, in that the problems of democracy could not be overcome. It could not be scaled up. It could not be duplicated. And that Athens was unique and different and distinctive in comparison. This is the historical foundation of democracy. And this is a history that we may not have known had we not taken a moment to look at it and to think about it. But democracy in its foundations really began to change at the end of the 18th century. Now this was the age of revolution, the late 1700s. This was a period where liberal values began to be reformed and reformulated and thought of differently. And really, most importantly, this was a moment where Aristotle's original distinction between the one, the few, and the many was replaced by a two-way distinction between democracy and autocracy. And so that distinction that we're now working with today, where we distinguish between authoritarian rule and democratic rule, really began to emerge around the period of the French and the American revolutions, other revolutions and 
South America and Latin America and elsewhere, this was a period where liberal values took hold and enlightenment thinking with regard to politics began to surge to the fore. The main cleavage, of course, again, being between democracy and aristocracy. And this involved, again, that elimination of the one, the few, and the many, and its replacement with this dichotomous distinction between authoritarian and democratic regimes. And this brings us up to the present, where we distinguish between those two types of government as polar types or polar different types, the kinds of sort of core forms of government that fall under the state or, or the, the organization of the state. Now, before we continue, I would like to hear from as many of you as possible. And I'm not gonna put you in groups. Instead, I'd like to sit back for just a moment. And I wanna ask you the simple question, how has our understanding of democracy changed since the days of Plato and Aristotle? I made some points already in the lecture that highlight some of the ways that democracy has evolved, albeit indirectly. I would love to hear from you and I'd like to hear your insights, but also maybe what you've taken so far from the lecture and from the presentation. Above all though, I just wanna hear from you and I wanna incorporate your input. So how has our understanding of democracy changed since the days of, of Plato and Aristotle. You can use the chat or you can also use the mic. Um, what do you think? What are some of the ways that our understanding of democracy has changed? Any ideas? Justice for all is my thing about democracy. Justice for all is uh, opportunities for all in and social justice and stop the um, discrimination because it's part of the democracy, okay? Absolutely. Okay. And we know that that's different from the, the period of Aristotle because remember that Aristotle and Plato thought that democracy couldn't serve the common interest. It couldn't produce justice for all. It couldn't produce outcomes that were favorable to the community they viewed it in the opposite way, right? That it would be a bad thing for the community. But today we clearly associate democracy with justice for all and, and opportunity and participation, representation in politics. And social movements in this country and elsewhere aspire to deepen justice for all and, and to really bring about a more just society and one that they view as more democratic. So there's been a reversal of our understanding of, of the desirability of democracy and whether it can really produce just outcomes. And so Anna Martha is connecting that and seeing those clear differences. And really that's so important to understand because remember that Aristotle and Plato were, were deeply skeptical of the capacity of democracy to do that for us. So how else has our understanding of democracy changed since the days of Plato and Aristotle? I think um, democracy has, has changed because us uh, because Plato didn't see um, democracy um, actually yeah democracy as like functioning. He said that it was viewed as like the uneducated poor against the un -edu like educated rich, which now like in these days is more like of the opposite way. So democracy, like in my perspective, has changed because like it's kind of a like ideal government of where some only individuals like 
benefit, for example, like tourism, like benefits, like, well, some individuals do not um, benefit from any perspectives of like government or yeah, and like in democracy, like, yeah, I hope that makes sense. So Efren, do you think that that democracy is, is beneficial to more people today than Plato or, or Aristotle would have anticipated? Um, I think honestly, I don't like, it's difficult to answer because democracy does function in certain manners, but also at the same time, it has not functioned in some, like in some aspects such as like justice and like reform, like democracy has like, like of what I said before, it has benefited for only certain individuals and democracy has is starting to evolve into more of like a new understanding of like who really is at the core of the center like who really does strive and who really does benefit while some individuals who are still fighting and that's how we can like we still have a misconception of really democracy in general yeah so efren is asking an important question which is democracy for who right who does democracy really benefit and does it serve the interest of the community and everyone in the community or, or is it a form of government that really primarily benefits those who can access democratic institutions? And this is an important realization. The desirability of democracy as an ideal is not in doubt, but the capacity of democratic governments as we find them to actually serve the interests of the community might be in doubt because those same interests and those same powerful figures and those same powerful groups still exist. And they're able to often make democratic governments work for them and maybe less for others. And thus we have a, a, a desperate need for these social movements that seek to enfranchise more groups and widen the radius of participation in politics and to create more representative government. But there's something interesting about Efren's point, which is that Democracy also creates a foundation for us to identify the shortcomings of government and to identify the ways that we would like to make it work better for us and for those individuals and groups who are not privy to democratic institutions or aren't able to benefit from the system in the way that others are. And so it's an interesting di discussion and question because on the one hand, we can see those limitations but it may also still be the case that democracy provides the best set of opportunities for us to correct the system. There's an old saying that of the forms of government, democracy is the least bad type or the, the best worst type. The idea that all forms of government are corrupt, but there are some that are, are less corrupt than others and that may be more salvageable than others. And this is, I think, a theme that will come out in this discussion and this, this lecture and, and on Thursday as well. And I'd like you to remain open to the possibility that our very ability to critique and identify the shortcomings might also be due to the way in which democracy does create a foothold for more of us than authoritarian government might create. And, and so this is an interesting and important discussion that touches on so many themes. Before we continue, can we hear from some more folks or some, other, some others who may have uh, supplemental points or other perspectives? Uh, what else is, is new about our understanding of democracy since the days of Plato and Aristotle? Um, am I, can you hear me? Am I good yeah. to go? Okay, um, well, one big thing is, uh, and I don't know if it's been talked about because I was, I had to, uh, but um, uh, is the, the re as representatives instead of a direct democracy and the allowance and like not mitigating voting to just rich white men that are landowners and have a certain threshold that they have to meet before that they can vote, whereas everyone can uh, vote for their uh, re representatives in republic. Absolutely. Right, representative democracy is now a thing. And our understanding of democracy is often really kind of structured by our understanding of representation as a concept. And that's not something that characterized their understanding of democracy then. It was really more like popular democracy, right? Or, or common democracy or direct democracy. And that may have influenced their understanding of, of the merits of the system since they viewed those common people like you and I 
as incapable and as uneducated and as unwilling to, to benefit the masses and really only to benefit ourselves. And so representation is obviously an important difference and not just that, uh, but the delegation of power to elected leaders and the trust that we place in elected leaders to represent us and to kind of express our interests and channel our interests and connect us to government. It's interesting to consider what we might think about a, with, when it comes to democracy if, if representation wasn't the concept. Would we still view it like Aristotle and Plato did? Would we be skeptical of democracy? There are many who are skeptical of direct democracy and common popular democracy, but representative democracy is very different in the sense that we kind of create these, these kinds of authoritarian leaders that we elect, right? They're authoritarian in the sense that we elect them and we give them power to rule over us and make decisions on our behalf. Now, the extent to which they make decisions on our behalf and that benefit us as a community and as a whole is in question. And sometimes with representation, there may, there may be a loss. There may be a loss of, of, of representation, so to speak, to build on Anna Martha's point in the way that justice and, and opportunity can sometimes be abridged for certain groups. And we see these deficiencies in democracies throughout the world. And this is something that we'll discuss today. There is no perfect democracy. In fact, Robert Dahl, one of the foremost theorists of democracy, said that we really only have polyarchies or systems of, of, of representative democracy that don't perfectly but imperfectly uh, sort of represent our interests and, and channel our interests and connect us to government. And so a lot has changed. A lot has changed. And clearly representation, the involvement of masses and the way that we're involved in politics, all of these things signal important departures from that early foundation set by Aristotle and Plato. As a political scientist, we are interested in how the world works. And, and what that means is that we've got to transform our understanding of democracy into concepts that we can use to answer substantive questions. And those questions relate to issues like whether democracies or dictatorships lead to higher levels of economic growth, whether democracies or dictatorships increase life expectancy, what factors increase the survival of democratic regimes? What factors increase the probability that a dictatorship will become a democracy? These are analytical questions. They are empirical questions that we can answer by examining the world and examining the patterns in the world in data. But in order to do that, we've got to transform our understanding of democracy into concepts that permit us to classify countries as democracies or dictatorships. Remember that we're moving from that distinction between one, few, and many to a distinction between democracy and dictatorship. And this is a simpler, more brittle distinction, a more primitive distinction, but it's one that helps us to identify the key differences between these forms of government. The question that we're asking, in other words, is, how do we know a democracy when we see one? In the corollary or the flip side of that question is how do we know a dictatorship when we see one? Now you already know that contestation in the form of uncertainty, irreversibility, and repeatability with regard to elections is an important component of a democratic regime. And that the violation of uncertainty uh, repeatability and irreversibility can distinguish a dictatorship from a democracy. We know this already from last week. We're gonna build on this distinction again this week, but we're going to expand it by taking a look at the criteria and the characteristics of democratic regimes as a sort of ideal type. Now, this is a discussion about how we measure and conceptualize democracy. And again, the key here is creating a set of concepts that permits us to classify countries in a certain way so that we in turn can answer analytical and, and empirical questions about the consequences and the causes of, of democratic regimes, which as we've already established, we largely agree are desirable from the perspective of promoting and advancing justice or opportunity or participation or representation. And so, 
this is what we're doing today. And this is what we'll continue with on Thursday. Our starting point is with the work of a theorist named Robert Dahl, who in 1971 addressed this question of how to translate our concept of democracy into these criteria. And Dahl distinguished it between two views of democracy that had been written about before him, but that he helped to kind of clarify the distinctions between. On the one hand, we have procedural or minimalist democracy. And this is democracy in terms of institutions and procedures. If we use a procedural or a minimalist definition of democracy, we're emphasizing processes and institutions, structures, things like elections and how contested they are, leadership selection and the election of the executive and so on and so forth. These are processes. They are structures or institutions. They are not outcomes. Those processes and those institutions will produce outcomes, but the outcomes themselves may be undemocratic, even if the processes and the institutions and the structures themselves are formally democratic. Now, those outcomes we associate with the substantive view. The substantive view of democracy is classifying political regimes in terms of the outcomes that they produce. From the substantive perspective, it's not enough to simply have democratic institutions and processes. Those institutions and processes must also produce outcomes that are themselves democratic. And so this connects to Anna Martha's point. Does the regime create an equality of opportunity? Does it promote justice for all? Is the regime corrupt or is it clean? To what degree are certain rights and liberties promoted by accountable governments? elected in, in freely and fairly and frequently conducted elections. These are outcomes. These are the products of those institutions and processes that are specific to the procedural or minimalist understanding of democracy. So in 1971, Dahl, distinguishing between these views or these definitions or these types, argued that we should really be using a procedural or, or a minimalist view of democracy. And the reason is because, well, it's a simpler concept that enables us to then examine whether or not democratic institutions and procedures can produce certain types of outcomes. If we use a definition that contains the outcomes as part of the definition, it introduces a tautology between the cause and the effect. And so Dahl said that we should use a minimal view of democracy so that we can find out what kinds of consequences follow from those institutions and those processes. This is the single most important distinction to begin our discussion of democracy, this distinction between procedural yeah. and substantive views. Now, let's go over this a little bit more, discussing in particular the procedural component. The procedural definitions focus on process. So Schumpeter in 1948 defined democracy in this way, and this is the classic procedural definition. The democratic method is that institutional arrangement for arriving at political decisions in which individuals acquire the power to decide by means of a competitive struggle for the people's vote. Now, in other words, this is a race between elites to capture the people's vote. Now we have all the elements here, but it's a very, very primitive, procedural, minimal definition that focuses on the process, that focuses on the institutions in the structure. Does not focus on the outcomes produced by that contest. That's a separate question. That's a substantive question. The procedural question is whether or not these processes and institutions exist and whether or not they structure these elections and these contests for the people's vote. Now, the thin procedural definition is about elections, and that's what you see here with Schumpeter. This kind of minimal focus on the electoral process itself. A thicker procedural definition goes a little bit further, and Robert Dahl elaborated on this thicker procedural definition by identifying seven minimal conditions that characterize or kind of distinguish a democracy. And in Dahl's view, 
centers on these seven minimal conditions. And these seven conditions are, first, control over government decisions is vested in elected officials. Number two, elected officials are chosen in frequent and fairly conducted elections. Number three, all adults have the right to vote, or as we would refer to it, universal suffrage. Number four, all adults have the right to run for elective office in the government. Five, freedom of expression. Six, media freedom. And seven, citizens have the right to form independent associations or organizations. Now these minimum conditions create a sort of basis for procedural democracy from the perspective of Dahl. These minimum conditions must be met, must be satisfied, according to Dahl, for a democracy to be a democracy. If they're not satisfied, it impairs the democratic credentials of that regime and makes it not democratic. Now, since Dahl, there have been additional conditions that have been added to the list by subsequent scholars who've learned from their own cases and from their own analyses what constitutes democracy and, and what does not. And so Schmitter and Carl in 1991, taking a look at Central American countries where they observed a profound influence for the military within what were putatively democratic regimes, said that there are two additional conditions that matter greatly that were not included in Dahl's list. And those include first, that no body or group of unelected officials like the military controls the decisions of elected leaders. Secondly, they added that the polity must be self-governing. And that is to say that that polity, that country must not be controlled by some outside power or some sort of pseudo or, or, or kind of imperialist external power that seeks to influence the course of events within a country so as to promote its own interests. We might think about a profound influence for the United States in countries like Nicaragua in the early 1910s and 20s, where the United States shamelessly marched troops on Nicaraguan soil every year for 30 years in an effort to promote US interests, democracy be damned. This is what Schmitter and Karl meant when they said the polity must be self-governing. There cannot be this kind of routine invasion or intervention from outside powers, and it cannot compromise the democratic integrity of the system. Nicaragua was a democracy at the time, but US intervention undermined the democracy. In 1996, Guillermo O'Donnell, also a student of Latin American politics, added two more dimensions, and those were government accountability and then the rule of law. Now, these additional conditions matter a great deal because they get to the kind of substance of those institutions and the extent to which they function in a way uh, that is responsive, is accountable, and embraces the values and the interests of, of, of the population as opposed to unelected groups or outside powers. These are important conditions of democracy that Dahl did not include and that extend our understanding of democracy. Now, I, say, I said earlier that, that Dahl, despite his favorable view of democracy, he actually didn't believe that any democracy truly was fully democratic. He didn't think that any large country in the world had ever fully democratized. Instead, he spoke of what he called polyarchies. And to clarify what he meant by polyarchies, he constructed two dimensions. These dimensions relate to Anna Martha's points from earlier about participation, opportunity, and justice for all. In, in the first place, Dahl emphasized inclusion, the question of who gets to participate in politics. Is it the case that universal suffrage is the norm? Does every adult or voting age adult truly get to vote? Or are there limitations or restrictions imposed on certain groups like ex-felons or felons or others who may not be able to vote because of laws that deny them enfranchisement. 
The second dimension was contestation. And this was the extent to which citizens have organized themselves into competing blocks, or the extent to which political parties or, or movements exist to kind of organize and mobilize the preferences of citizens. And again, we're, we're talking about ordinary people, right? Those masses like you and I, who Aristotle and Plato were so skeptical of. Now, Dahl's insights were extremely important because they've been incorporated into many measures of democracy. Remember that our key question is, if we accept and recognize the desirability of democracy from the perspective of responsiveness, accountability, rights and liberties, et cetera, well, how can we transform our understanding of democracy into concepts that we can use to answer empirical and analytical questions? Dahl's insights have become the foundation for these types of measures. Now, before we address those types of measures, we'll take a look at those two dimensions of democracy, contestation and inclusion. What you see is that in the far upper right-hand corner, we've got polyarchies, which are the ideal types. Remember, there's no perfect democracy. Instead, we've got polyarchies. They can be distinguished based on their degree of contestation and their inclusion. And so the United States today largely approximates that, that polyarchy. Now, this is a debate and discussion that we can have at length. We've already talked about some of the, uh, the, the possible limitations to, to US democracy. But generally speaking, we would consider the US today to be in a broad sense, a polyarchy of the ideal type. Accepting that that does mean that there are some limitations on suffrage in that there's not perfect inclusion and perfect contestation. On the other hand, we've got a country like China where there is virtually no contestation. There's rule by the Communist Party and there's limited inclusion in terms of who's actually able to vote and participate in politics. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, was more inclusive and yet it was also still largely uncontested in the sense that any candidates or anyone who could potentially enter into office would be selected by the party leadership. And this is also the case in China. So there's not any real contestation. We can think about cases like apartheid South Africa, where there were high degrees of contestation, at least in terms of the competing parties and movements, but very low inclusion because of, of course, the black majority being totally excluded and subjugated under apartheid. Pre-1830, the United States, with slavery or the remnants of, no, excuse me, I'm <laughs> forgetting historical time, uh, slavery and of course, eventually Jim Crow, which would reproduce a lot of those inequalities, was also a regime that had a higher degree of contestation, but a very low degree of in inclusion because of the subjugation of blacks and really anyone who wasn't a, a white male, it included women too. Pre-1971 Switzerland and pre-1945 France are somewhere in the middle. You can get the sense then that there's variation across time and space in contestation and inclusion. And to what degree different cases approximate the ideal polyarchy varies considerably. These two dimensions are so useful because they capture this variation and they help us to understand how different regimes fit and relate to each other across time and space. Now, before we get into some of the measures of democracy, we need to identify what democracy is not. This is a question that's equally important because we often treat democracy as some kind of magic bullet. It is not a magic bullet. In fact, from the procedural perspective, it's merely a set of institutions or a set of processes that don't guarantee any outcomes. The outcomes themselves can be undemocratic. Even if the elections in the processes are putatively democratic. And so, for instance, a democracy is not necessarily better economically. It's not necessarily better administratively. It's not necessarily more orderly or consensual or stable or governable. It's not necessarily more open economically. These various considerations 
all are separate from the actual essence of a democracy from the procedural perspective. These types of things are not guaranteed and are not insured. It may be that there are many examples of democracies that are stronger economically, but maybe those things don't have anything to do with each other. Again, these are empirical analytical questions that we address by forming concepts and using measures of democracy to answer analytical and, and empirical questions. The question of what kinds of outcomes democracies produce is possibly the most important set of questions of all because we wanna know what can we get from our democratic regimes or our polyarchies to use Dahl's language. We arrive then at this question of how do we measure democracy? How have we operationalized the concept and how do we understand it in a systematic way that permits us to classify some regimes as democratic and some regimes as authoritarian? And in this course, we focus on the three key measures in comparative politics. There are others, but these three are the ones that have kind of framed the discussion in comparative politics. And we use, we use these measures most widely. And so oftentimes in the debates that we have, the debate is kind of set or kind of undergirded by agreement about the usefulness of different measures in distinguishing between one type of regime in, in another. And those three measures are the democracy dictatorship measure, which we call DD, the polity for measure, and then the freedom house measure. And we're gonna discuss each of these in turn. The DD measure is the most sort of primitive of all. And I don't use that as a slight. It's the simplest in the sort of most procedural definition of all and the most procedural operationalization of all because it focuses primarily on Dahl's notion of contestation and Schumpeter's notion of competition. From the perspective of DD, a democracy is a regime in which those who govern are selected through contested elections. And DD as a measure also carries with it a data set. And the empirical scope for the data set is 199 countries from 1946 or independence, depending upon which came first, to 2008. And I know that many of us will be dissatisfied with that, that temporal sort of scope. It's not satisfying. We'd like to have new data because much has happened since 2008. But what I'd like to tell you is that this measure is a measure that you can use to evaluate and classify any regime that you find. And that includes those regimes in 2020 and all those years in between 2008 and 2020. And so it does carry with it a data set, but it above all is a measure that we can use to evaluate and classify regimes according to contestation and competition. Now along those lines, we do the following to figure out if a country is a dictatorship or a democracy. We have four questions. And these are all very objective questions. There's hardly any degree of subjectivity here. These are essentially yes, no questions. There's not much gray here at all. First, is the chief executive elected? Second, is the legislature elected? Third, is there more than one party competing in elections? Fourth, has there been an alternation in power under identical electoral rules. Now, if these conditions hold, the country is a democracy. But if these four conditions do not hold, if even a single one of them does not hold, then the country is a, is a dictatorship. And the measure is really, really simple. The country is either a dictatorship or a democracy, period. There's no in between. We can maybe distinguish between different types of dictatorships, but the key different differentiating factors are these four components of contestation and competition. Now, you may wonder, is there not more to the story? But remember that this is a procedural definition, meaning it's a minimal definition that focuses on processes and institutions. 
in the structures of the regime and whether or not those structures are democratic in the way that we think of dem democracy from the vantage point of contestation and competition. And so this is a procedural minimal definition. And it's one where contestation plays a particularly important role. And remember that we distinguished between three different dimensions of contestation. We use these not just to evaluate the potential consequences of some of Donald Trump's recent comments. We also use these to think about the difference between authoritarian and democratic regimes. Contestation breaks down into uncertainty, irreversibility, and repeatability. Contestation occurs when there is an opposition that has some chance of actually winning office as a consequence of elections. You know, is there really a contest here, right? Or is it the case that we kind of know who's going to win, either because the playing field has been tilted or because the opposition has been disqualified and so on. And so that first dimension of contestation is uncertainty. The question here is, is the outcome of the election unknown before it takes place? If we know the outcome before it takes place, if everyone who's anyone knows who's gonna win, well, it's not an uncertain election. It's not a competitive or a contested election. Does the winner of the electoral contest actually take office? Important issue. If the winner of the election doesn't take office and the incumbent nullifies the electoral result, that violates irreversibility. And we can't say that the re regime is one with contestation and is fully democratic. And then there's the issue of repeatability, and that is, do the elections occur at regular and known intervals? Now, these are dimensions that you're familiar with already, but we need to underscore the importance of these dimensions of contestation to this measure, this democracy dictatorship measure that we use to transform our concept into something that we can use to evaluate and analyze countries. Now, contested elections are very important, but they're not sufficient for a DD classification of democracies. You also need an alteration in power under identical electoral rules. What that means is that the incumbent government or the incumbent party hands power over to a different party. In other words, one party rule is not consistent with democracy. One party rule is by definition undemocratic according to the DD measure. Now the problem is, it's hard to distinguish between a regime where the incumbents never lose power because they are popular and a regime where incumbents hold elections because they know they will not lose those elections. These two are observationally equivalent. They're essentially the same thing. And so there's, there's almost no qualitative difference between them. And so we can't know just by examining the patterns whether A or B is obtaining. And so we've got examples like Botswana or Japan or Malaysia or Mexico. All of these are examples of countries that experienced extended periods of one party rule. And though if we look into the details, it becomes clear often whether it was a dictatorship or a democracy, at least on the surface, we can't distinguish between whether A or B is really obtaining here. And so, we can take the examples of Mexico and Japan. In Mexico, the Institutional Revolution Party was founded in 1929, emerged out of the Mexican Revolution, and held power from 1929 to 2000. There was no alternation in power between 1929 and 2000 in Mexico. The PRI ruled continuously during that period. Is that a democracy or a dictatorship? Based on this information, it's difficult to know. Japan has a similar story. The Liberal Democratic Party was founded in 1955 and held power from 1955 to 1993. These are both examples of one party rule, but how do we know if they were remaining in power because they were popular or because they only held elections because they knew that they would not lose them? Good question. We would have to look into the cases themselves 
we would have to have knowledge about the cases themselves to be able to say. Now, many of you may be thinking to yourself, well, I think that at least in the case of Mexico, it was not a democratic regime. We're at the University of California and California's regional connection with Latin America means that we often know more about Latin America. In Mexico, the PRI was a, an authoritarian party that would rig elections, purchase the support of voters using patronage, um, and would tilt the playing field and use corruption to stay in power. And so oftentimes, more often than not, the regime did not appear democratic. You might call it semi-authoritarian, but the democratic dictatorship measure would distinguish between democracy and dictatorship and would probably categorize Mexico as a dictatorship because of that absence of the alternation of power and moreover because of the limited uncertainty of, of the electoral results. Japan is a more difficult case. What do we say about Japan? Maybe it's hard to say because Many would agree that in Japan, one party rule has been the product of the continued popularity of the Liberal Democratic Party. But some might also point out that that party ruled in a way that was not consistent with uncertainty or contestation or competition, possibly because of influences stemming from the post-war period, their relationship with the United States, and some of the geopolitical considerations that related to the regime type in the form of government in Japan. Now, these are all details that we would have to look into further. But the point that I want to make to you is that at least on the surface, the DD measure would not qualify these regimes as democratic. We might want to look into them and find out if there was more going on and more to the story, but the absence in the alternation of power would mean that these are dictatorships. Take a look at the 2008 data which is the most recent data for all countries. And what you see is uh, quite a range in terms of the types of authoritarian regimes. But the key distinction again is between democracy and dictatorship. And we can distinguish then between parliamentary and mixed or presidential democracies. Those are characteristics of democracies that we'll discuss later on in the course. But for our purposes, the key distinction is between democracies and dictatorships. And so this is what we see when we look at this data in 2008. Now, what I can tell you is that 2008 was an important moment because it saw really the apex of democratization throughout the world. By 2011, for example, in Latin America, of all 18 countries that share a colonial history with Spain or Portugal, all were democratic. But today, 12 years later, the story has changed considerably. Of those 18 countries, four have transitioned from democracy to authoritarianism. This is a pattern that's been reproduced throughout the world. Democracy is in decline. And this is discouraging from the vantage point of accountability and representation, rights and liberties, and checks on abuses of power by, by executives in dictatorships. These patterns we'll discuss more on Thursday. And on Thursday, we'll also address the next two measures, the Freedom House measure and the Polity Four measure, before we eventually make our way to a discussion of some of the causes of democratization and then the types of democratic transitions and the stages in the process of democratic transitions. But we close today by clarifying that democracy dictatorship as a measure builds on Dahl in two ways. It does adopt a purely procedural or minimalist view of democracy like Dahl. It also focuses on Dahl's notion of contestation. But the main difference is that DD treats regime type as a dichotomy, democracy or dictatorship, rather than as a continuum, more or less democratic. And this simple dichotomy is the essence of the DD measure, and it's what makes it a useful measure when we try to answer certain types of research questions. And this does help to bring us to the end of today's discussion. I hope that you found this useful, and I hope that this was enlightening for you. On Thursday, we'll continue the discussion 
and we'll get further into the details of these patterns, the causes of democratic transitions and the types of transitions, the stages in the process of democratization, and we'll ultimately have a, a discussion about what the future may hold. And this does conclude the discussion. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you very much for being here. You're free to go. Um, I will stick around and take any questions or comments